This is one where, uh, you know, you do have to talk to the patient, your point, Mike. And so I, I think, Steve, weren't we, before this program, we were talking, and one, one of the cardiologists on this panel mentioned, I don't want to take a medication. Did you hear that earlier? earlier? <laughs> <laughs> or did you? Yes. I think we heard that, didn't we? Uh, so Somebody did say that. I would say someone wise and you know, cautious. Yes, I did hear someone say that. That, that comes up not infrequently. Uh, and they, they actually see me because their primary care physician told him, I want to search you on a statin. And they said, well, let me go see what he says, too. And I say the same thing they say, but then I don't want to take a medication. So I think this is where a coronary calcium score, if it's a 50-year-old man, can be very, because, you know, they, it's going to come. And it, so they say, okay, listen, you've got already clearly atherosclerosis. You've got plaque. Now, a caution, and this is the thing about the power of zero, the power of zero is age and gender dependent. So this is a very important thing. If that's a 35-year-old man and he has a zero calcium score, that doesn't mean much of anything. And if it's a 35-year-old woman, she shouldn't have gotten a test uh, with it. So I think it's, you know, it's age dependent. So it, 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 it is a useful test, but if you look at younger people, it's very rare to have calcium. And so, I think the, the data is that uh, uh, women, by the, women around the age of 40, around 2%. Does that mean 98% of women shouldn't ever be treated? Or, you know, it's the same thing for men, it's a small. So I think you have to be very cautious in terms of, of, of downgrading risk in a young person. Let me just mention one more thing, uh, and that is that we get these patients, of course, too, a lot of them in our prevention clinic who say, I don't want to take that, those terrible drugs, statins. And I am a stage of my career when I can take time with patients, not everybody can, and I will spend whatever amount of time I have to, I will actually give them the articles, you know, I will walk them through them, uh, we will engage in, you know, what people sometimes call shared decision making, where I say, here are the facts, I will be very blunt with them that what they're reading on the internet is nonsense. I can use stronger words than that if I want to, but we can't because there's general audience here. And uh, thank you for your and, restraint. And uh, and I just don't let up. I arrange to see them again in a month, uh, and I keep with them because coronary disease is a disease best prevented. And it may take several visits. And it may that. take several visits. And you know we have some. We have a skilled interventionist here, Dr. Bott, who can fix the coronary when they come in with their acute MI, but I want to put you out of business. You know, I don't want you ever to have to rush somebody to the cath lab with a big anterior wall MI. And the way to do that is identify these people at risk. And I do not think the very conservative American guidelines are good enough. And I'll be very blunt about that. You know, I, I've felt this for a long time, that we can prevent this disease in a lot more people if we're willing not to have a very fixed and arbitrary. And frankly, the risk calculators don't even work very well. They've been shown to be inaccurate. And so you got to use common sense. You can't be an automaton that plugs everybody into an equation and it just determines what you're going to do. I had one question for everybody, because I'm getting a lot of these kids now referred to me. At what age are you comfortable with starting a statin in, 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 in patients with heterozygous FH? Seven or eight. Yeah, it, it has been shown, studies have shown that it doesn't impair growth, which was one of the concerns, and maturation. So uh, once they're identified as, as young as possible, we just... And then we just had that wonderful article published recently showing that if you treat kids and compare them to their parents, uh, they don't fall off the curve the way their parents did with regards to cardiovascular events. Yeah. Really wonderful data. Yeah. Now, for FH, I agree, but you also see these kids that have more of a polygenic, you know, and they're, there they're are not a lot more of these. Much more common, yeah. Much yeah. more common, yeah. Much more. yeah they're, not, they're not 220, right. you know. But if you see a 10-year-old with an LDL of 170, you know, that's very ominous. And so what I've been doing with the more polygenic, you know, kids is waiting until they're about 12 or 13, you know, just when they're hitting puberty. I can't give you a good reason for that. But keep in mind that the safety data is very limited. It's, it's small pocket. Steve, I think there is a reason because what ends up happening, if they have FH, then we know that now what, because at puberty things change a lot. So there are people who's, you don't get a really valid number until post-puberty yeah. for some of these people. It is important uh, to start them 
before while they're at home, and the worst thing you do is start someone who's going to college, wow. uh, uh, and and because we used to wait until later, and then of course the adherence and, and it's just you know that's it's, so it's, that's a mistake to avoid. I have had very bad experiences with adolescents and medications, and uh, they go off to college and they come back and I get an LDL and it's not good. And I say, do you take your medicine? Yeah, you take my medicine. Do you really take your medicine? Well, occasionally I forget, you know. They're going to parties and there's a little bit of drink. I heard that there are actually some drinking on college campuses. I'm Shocker. shocked because it didn't, we didn't do that when I was in college, but I hear that that's going on. And you know, and the reality is, is that you gotta get those kids through adulthood and the yeah. adolescent stepping out that occurs and in FH, that makes me that's worry. Yeah, and we, we, we see that in a lot of our, our FH kids who then go off to college and then leave home and often discontinue care until they've kind of reestablished a life and are working, et cetera, partly because they've been on medications for so long and part of the family unit. They're, they're kind of spreading their wings, so to speak, and, and they need, they need to, to, to be kind of pulled back in with regards to treatment and, and aggressive therapy if they have FH. I have a fog talk with them. Fog means fear of God. <laughs> and I basically say, look, you have, a, you have a curable but very serious disorder that can cause you to have a heart attack at a young age. No matter what happens, you need to remember this and don't go off treatment. And I tell them every time I see them and I emphasize it and I emphasize it. And I've been doing a little bit better, but it's not perfect. Yeah, I know it's an important point.